co-host, and I am a co-host of this Agile Lean group, along with Michelle, who's back there. I see some familiar faces, so thanks for coming back tonight, and I see some new faces, so thanks for coming out to our group. It's really nice to see a big crowd here tonight. We meet on the last Tuesday of every month, so you're always welcome to come out and join us again. Tonight, I want to talk about JIRA. It's a tool a lot of us are using, whether we chose to be using it or not. In my case, I've never chose to use it, but every company I've worked with in the last 10 years has been using it, and so I have just found ways to make it work for me. Um, so I've worked with JIRA at six different companies, um, dozens of teams I've supported using JIRA, I've been a JIRA admin for the last four years. Uh, I've been using JIRA since 2010, since uh, they brought in Agile Greenhopper, if anybody remembers that far back. Um, I want to share some of my favorite and most used tips. You're not going to learn everything there is to know about JIRA in 30 minutes because it is a massive piece of software. But I am uploading my slide and my speaker's notes. And I have a, the last slide in the deck is some pointers to some references I really like. So hopefully it's enough to send you back with at least one new idea. And um, my focus is software releases. I work with software development teams. So you might find I'm a little biased towards that usage. But um, a lot of us in this community are. So hopefully you'll find it relevant. Oh yes, sorry. I just want to mention that this session is being recorded. If anyone has any concerns about being recorded, um, you can speak to George, but he's going to record the session and post it to our meetup group as well. But that'll get started. So uh, just an overview of what I'm going to walk through. I've got um, I want to talk about cloud versus server for a second because what I show on my screens tonight may not look like what you're seeing in your workplace. You kind of need to understand that difference. Um, I'm, it's not a, a, an official distinction, but I like to think about there's sort of the items in JIRA and then there's the views in JIRA. So there's boards, filters, projects, there's reports, there's dashboards, there are views, there are containers. Um, I want to talk about the workflows. I'm going to touch on how you can customize them. And um, I'm going to touch on plugins, integrations, and uh, the smart commits that you can plug into. And uh, I'm going to show you next gen because I'm on Jira Cloud. So it might be a feature you haven't seen if you're on Jira Cloud. And then I'm going to I have some links that just for taking away. Sound OK? If there's any topics I missed, then uh, you can throw your hand up. But I, I have 22 slides and 30 minutes. So I'm going to go pretty fast. That's why I have the slides prepared so you can take them home. <coughs> so I want to just have a little bit of an understanding of the group I'm speaking to tonight. So if you could put your hand up if you don't use JIRA and you just came for the beer. <laughs> Anyone fall into that category? Because that's okay. Uh, who is a JIRA system administrator, a global administrator? We have a few, okay. And uh, people who are not global administrators but have administrator access to like a project that they're running. So we have more of that category. And people who are your users, you, you don't have the ability to go in and customize things. We've got a bit of that too. Okay, so mixed group tonight. So um, I'm, I'm kind of going to speak to all levels. I'm going to jump around a bit. But sometimes even if you're a user and you can't do the system administrator stuff, understanding what they have done on your back end is really helpful for you understanding why things are working for you the way they are. So I want to touch on, because I have worked with a lot of teams over the years, and there are certain things that have come up for me a lot when I'm working with people, I just wanted to touch on these before I jump into things. So a lot of times, especially when people are near new to JIRA, they are afraid to touch anything because they're afraid they're going to break something of someone else's. And um, it's, it's not an unhealthy fear, but I also think the best way to learn, because you can, I've accidentally reprioritized backlogs, um, but um, I, it's the best way to learn is to do it. So I want to encourage people to go in, and there's a few slides where I'll say, this is a really safe place to experiment, you won't break things. And, um, and I just have a few tips in my speaking notes here, uh, which you can get from Meetup later if you want. Um, if you're a system admin, obviously, you know you can make backups before you um, make changes to things like workflows and things. 
Um, in your organization, could you have someone create for you a uh, pretend, I call them sandboxes, can you have someone give you a sandbox project that you can make changes in? That's a really great way to learn. Um, the Atlassian documentation is excellent, so sometimes when I'm doing something as an administrator I've never done before, I follow these steps just exactly. I just, I don't mess with anything, I just follow the script. That's a great way if you're not sure what you're doing. Um, find someone who's done it before and outline the steps exactly so you're not guessing. Uh, sometimes what I do if I'm messing with something I've never had to mess with before, make a change in the morning, not right before you go home at night. And, uh, <laughs> tip. Um, let it sit for a day. Like, so don't, if, if, if your team says, oh, let's do all these new things in JIRA, don't do all the new things in JIRA Tuesday morning. Do one new thing in JIRA Tuesday morning and see if anyone's complaining about it by Wednesday. And then if you broke something, you know the thing you changed rather than making 10 changes and not knowing the thing that you changed that broke it. Um, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to move there. So to, um, just give me a second. Uh, some people, one of the challenges that people will run into is they want JIRA to only work one way. Like a Microsoft project you, or a product, you go to file and you go to save as, and everything, you go to Excel and you go to file and you go to save as, and it's the same. And people look for that sameness, and JIRA doesn't do that particularly well. Because what it does really well is let you customize everything. And then it can be confusing because you might work with one team and it looks one way and you work with another team and it looks completely different and you change companies and you say, yes, I know JIRA and you look at theirs and it's not what you know. Um, that can be uncomfortable for people. Um, so my advice on that is don't look for that um, global best practice of how to set up JIRA, but look for uh, what your team needs. If you have the option to customize, Customize based on what is best for your team and the group you're working with. Don't necessarily go with, you know, some global best practice you found online. It might not be best for your team. And um, if you're learning, because you're so huge, you're probably not going to say, oh, um, I'm going to carve out a couple hours Monday morning and learn everything about Jira. But you might pick one thing and you might say, Filters look really good to me. I'm going to carve out some time Monday morning and I'm going to get really good at using filters because I think that would help me a lot. And then maybe next month you say dashboards look really great. So just break it down. Um, and then um, if you can, if you're at a company, and, and uh, my, uh, my first experiences with Jira come from BlackBerry. It was very, very locked down in software development of BlackBerry. Um, but they had like an advisory board you could join, so you could like, if you're in a really big company that's locked down or Manulife, those companies, sometimes you can get onto an advisory board. So um, just throwing that out, that if you are a user and you're not loving Jira, you might have that as an option in your company. So uh, the versions I talked about. So there's Jira Cloud and there's Jira Server. So um, my screenshots are from Jira Cloud, which is to say, Jira updates whenever the heck it wants. I just come in and there's new things in my Jira. Um, you may be in an IT organization where you're Jira server, so you're not in the cloud, you're on a server in your environment, and you may have an IT department who's controlling upgrades. So you may actually be several versions back, which means you may not have some of the features you see tonight. Um, so I just want you to understand that difference mainly. And um, so this, um, this is just how I like to think of the data. So there is some, some items that are they're like entries in the database. It's not metadata, they're, they're line items, if that makes sense. Um, and out of the box, typically you'll see bugs, tasks, stories, and epics. Now epics are a container, so they're a little bit in the middle, but um, this is helpful for me to think about these items because these are the ones if you change, you, you're impacting other people if you change the items. And then um, there's other ones here. So epics um, are container stories, can have subtasks, so they can become containers too. And then um, the other thing about this is you can customize it. So you could have a hundred different types if you wanted. You, you might have research spikes, you might have documentation items, you might have 
whatever. And so this is another way it becomes confusing for people is because your organization might have a lot and um, you know, my best practice is to keep it as simple as you can, but if you are confused in your organization, it may be something that your group has brought in, not the company. Um, yeah? Sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, so, I think I covered my speaking notes there. Like I said, I'm moving pretty quick because I have a lot of content. So, um, what I call the views I like to think of them a little bit differently than the items because a lot of times you can make a lot of different views for different needs and you're not messing up other people's work by creating views. So that's kind of the distinction in my head. You're a little bit safer with, there's just a user interface view of what's actually in the database. By the view you mean the, what you get from the filter? From the filter or when you build a board what is presented, yeah. But mostly all of the views are uh, the result of filtering. Correct. Nothing else. That's correct, yeah. Okay, so um, these are, they're very customizable, all of the views. So I'm gonna give you some screenshots here, but uh, again, it'll be different in your organization. Now this is a next generation project with the, sorry, I keep putting my finger puppets on the recording. Um, this is a next gen project. You can tell the difference because it let me put a picture on my card. So if anyone's thinking, hey, cool, there's a picture on your card. Uh, you do probably don't have that feature if you're on a server. That's one of the way you can uh, know the difference. But um, a few things I want to talk about with boards. Boards are normally where a team is doing their day-to-day -day working. And um, usually, you want a single board that everyone on your team is looking at. So that same view for everybody. And then um, <coughs> there's also examples where you may want to have some extra boards. So this is where... Um, this is where I like to go in as a project manager, um, and I'm supporting a lot of teams who I don't want to check six boards every morning. I can make another board that combines all of the information from my six other teams, and I don't have to look at six boards, I look at this one. And I don't have to share it to anybody else. By making this board, I did not change anybody else's view. My team can stick with their view. This is just my view. So boards is one of those safe places where you can go and you can experiment you can create your own, you won't mess with other people. But if you change priorities on a board or you assign epics, that will still carry across to other people. So a few other examples of where it's really helpful to have boards. I mentioned like a, a project manager, a scrum master, uh, when you support multiple teams. Um, on my personal board that I will create, I like to put in some metrics, like I like to flag items that have been in the same state for 10 days or more, then, then those ones get marked red for me. So on my board, I like to flag things like that. Um, you know, it, not necessarily the same things that the team cares about, but I'm looking for impediments. And so on my board, I can add in some of those customizations, which for the day-to-day -day team would be noise. It would be cluttered for them. Um, as a product manager, you might want to, um, a couple of scenarios. So you might be a product manager with multiple teams contributing to what you're trying to bring to market and um, your org structure might mean that they're all in their own JIRA project and so now as a product manager you could make a single board that shows either just the epics you care about or just the items you care about. You can pick and choose what you care about and you can make yourself one board and then you can prioritize from here. So you don't have to prioritize in all the different um, teams, and uh, it will carry across to the to the other ones. So that's another example uh, where it can be helpful to have your own. Um, sometimes developers want their own board uh, because often developers get split across multiple projects, and so they don't want to go into multiple boards. So a developer might say, just show me everything in JIRA that's in my name because I don't care about all of the things in all of the projects. So we get into these scenarios where you're perfectly safe to go in and create a board and customize it to your specific needs. Uh, so.
filters are my personal best friend. This is where I spend most of my time. If you're a Jira user and you've never spent time with filters, this is the one I would say, please, when you get back to work, spend a little bit of time in filters because this can uh, make a lot of your headaches go away if you know how to use them well. So filters are, they can be temporary. It's just a search. When I say filter, it's just a search you've created for items. And um, it can be temporary or you can save it and then it will be bookmarked for you. Um, you can also share it. So if there's a specific list, like show me everything that has been closed in the last 30 days with a resolution of whatever, um, those kinds of things, then you can save it and you can share it. And then you can also make boards from them and things like that. Um, so they use a language called jQL, which is based on SQL, Jira, SQL, I think is their clever combination there, Jira <laughs> query language maybe, should have looked that up first. Um, if you if you struggle with the logic, like you haven't done, if you, you don't have a development background, Jira has an amazing blog post that tells you exactly how to do everything and I've put a, a link to that in the back end. So don't be intimidated by the and and the or statements and the does not equal if, you can do it. They have really good documentation on that. And if you're already familiar with SQL, then you should be doing this because it'll be super easy and you'll love it. Um, so filters are what is behind a lot of other things that you'll make. So uh, you can make dashboards based on filters. You can make boards based on filters. Um, gadgets are based on filters. So uh, filters are a really good thing to know. And then just also in your day-to-day -day work, um, if you can see here, I'm just going to step back over here, um, you can also customize the columns that you see. So if you just want a single source of, of everything, the backlog, when you're looking at the backlog or an active sprint, it might not show you all the fields you want. So in this view, you can go in, you can customize the columns that you see, you can customize the order that they're in, and you can sort by the field. So it's just a lot more dynamic if you're trying to look at a specific set of items. And then some other things you can do here. Um, so you can make new filters. You can save your filters. Uh, you can control the permissions if you want. You can share it to everybody, lock it down to a specific group of users or a project. You can, um, this is one of my favorite things. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you can export your search from here. So as a project manager, I do a ton of government reporting. I do executive reporting. I do all of that stuff. What I do is I make a filter that shows me exactly what I need. I export it to Excel. I use a pivot table. I make pretty graphs. It can be a lifesaver. It saves you a ton of work. You don't have to count things. You can use G Suite or Excel. It will do all of the counting for you. You can get the metrics you need, um, not by relying on Jira, but by knowing how to export to CSV and then manipulating it in another tool. That's, that's my best lifesaver. <laughs> Um, and then you can also, you can export to like Word, uh, you could print the list if you wanted, um, various <coughs> options. I also want to talk about from this same view, all of these are under these different drop down menus. I'm not leaving this screen, this is just the filter view. From this same view, you can bulk change items. So um, maybe someone says, oh, we're collapsing these two projects, we're going to put them into one. This is where you can bulk change all of the items from that project into this project. Maybe they say uh, that epic with those 53 stories all need closed because we changed direction. You do not want to manually change 53 items. This is your bulk change. You can transition them from one state to another. Um, you can uh, you could bulk add labels. You can bulk remove labels. You can, um, I don't know, basically anything you can do from a detailed view. If you create your, your jQuery correctly and get the items you want, you can do that from here. One thing I've noticed is you can't anymore um, uh, bulk change multiple projects items at one time. I don't know if that's just cloud. I used to be able to do that. But just pointing that out, you, sometimes you have to go one project at a time. How do you change priorities? You said you can change priorities. Yeah, so it's a bulk change, <coughs> and then one of the it'll uh, it gives you options like edit or um, transition. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it just presents you with a list of all of the fields. 
Um, so you can also toggle, right now what I'm showing way up here, that's an advanced view. So that's the filter that I've created. This is uh, show me everything in these projects, which are bugs or stories, and does not have the label. Uh, we're doing some government funded projects, doesn't have my IRAP label, doesn't have my other label. Um, and it was resolved in the time period of my projects, or um, the labels field is empty. That's an important one. Some of the ones, especially around labels, if you just say, um, show me everything that doesn't have this label, it won't show you blank fields. So you have to add the or clause and then say, or show me anything that's blank. Um, but if, if that's overwhelming for you, that's okay, because you can actually just toggle. You can't necessarily do the or statement that I did, um, and, and doing the does not equal is you can't do, but there's also a basic view, and it just gives you familiar drop downs. Mm -hmm. So if you just want to get started with filters, you don't have to do the jQuery. You can just do the drop downs like you would see in any software, where you just say, it lists all your projects, and you tick the box. This project is what I care about. This person is who I want to see. Oh, and the other, um, the other still on the filters is that was the first view. Uh, you can also change the layout. I was showing you the detail view. This is the uh, item view, the list view. Um, so if you just want to make a bunch of changes, you can edit any of these fields like you could if you were on the backlog view and you get the little pop-up pane on the far right. Um, this is a similar view but allows you to say, uh, show me all bugs across all projects which were closed in January because I want to go in and add a label to them, whatever you want to do. So just um, a note that that field is there as well. So I want to talk about uh, projects. Um, projects are another container and then can get a little tricky. So a lot of times I've worked with teams and they say, well, how should we define a project? Maybe you've got a big three-year uh, project that's being funded. Is that the project? Or is the phase zero three-month evaluation thing you're working on right now, is that the project? Or maybe you've got a web development team who uh, wants all of their work together. They're a cohesive team. Is the web team the, the project? Um, and I don't think there's a hard and fast rule on that. That's one of the ones where people <coughs> seem to want me to like tell them how it's supposed to be. And um, my answer is usually it depends. You, you, you really have to figure out what's best for your organization. There's no hard and fast rule there. Um, but projects are a way of grouping a large amount of related items. Um, so it could be in that traditional sense of a project it could be by um, a development team. It could be by a product you're bringing to market. You're, you're going to see lots of different groupings. You really have to talk to your team and figure out what's going to be right for them. You can um, control a lot of details at a project level, unless it's locked down. Um, so you can change who has access to projects. So you're working on something confidential, pre-release. You can set up projects that other people don't have access to. You can. Um, you can uh, set up your releases in here, so or the fixed versions. Um, you can control your workflows in here sometimes if you if you have the permissions. So you can do a lot of customization for your specific project if you've got access to do that. This is um, that's just the overview screen I'm showing right there, but. Over on the far side, you can see all of the different headings that I could go in and I could customize for this specific project. So, JIRA also gives you a lot of built-in reporting. And I'm surprised at how many times people will say, oh, I didn't know that was there. And I feel like, how are you doing your job? Because a lot of times, <laughs> the person that says that to me is someone who probably should have been looking at them. Or maybe I should have been putting it in front of their face. You can make that argument. Um, but it depends on if you have a Kanban project, a Scrum project, next-gen projects are different again, the types of reports that will be available out to you out of the box. But there are quite a few, and, and really commonly used stuff, like average time to resolve a ticket, um, your sprint burn downs, your velocity charts, none of these things have to be manually created. 
Jira puts them all into a pretty picture out of the box for you. Um, release burn downs, there's epic burn downs, there's um, some other metrics around the issues. So um, this is another place where you're 100% safe to go into reports and look at reports and change the time interval that the report is is uh, reporting on. You will not break anything. You won't mess anything up. So reports is another place to go in and experiment and feel very safe that you're not uh, messing with anybody else's work. And it's a great place to see if there's something that you're doing manually that Jira could automate for you. Um, I like to use the reports for, uh, they're handy for retrospectives. So if you want to drive the right conversation, the JIRA reports can do the hard work of showing you where the problems are, and then you can just show that to the team. So for example, a control chart might show you that it takes you three weeks to move anything from in progress to done, and you want to be moving things in five days. JIRA gives you a control chart, it will show that for you. Um, you don't have to go in and do all that calculation for yourself. Um, it's great for executive reporting. Uh, they're formatted nicely. Uh, the data isn't being manipulated by a middle person. You can trust mm. it. It's great for forecasting. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of validating uh, people's personal forecasts. Like, yeah, I can do that in six weeks with some metrics around, well, did they do the last thing that was about this size in six weeks? Um, it's really important, in my opinion, for using it for accurate forecasting if you care about accuracy in your forecasts, which I do. <laughs> and um, it's also a great place to identify trends. So maybe you go in and you look at your creative <coughs> versus resolve chart, and you see that every day you create 10 new items, and every week you close two. Yeah. Well, you've got a trend there. Um, you didn't have to look too hard. Jira gave you that report. All you have to go in, do is go in and check. So I'm going to touch on dashboards. Um, this is another place where you're safe to go in and create your own dashboard. You won't break anything by creating a dashboard. So go in and play with the dashboard, add gadgets to the dashboards. Um, it's, a, it's a great place to experiment with filters. If you've already created them, you can just out of the box, it gives you the dashboard, it does everything, or sorry, it gives you the gadget, which is a gadget, each of these is a gadget on a dashboard. Um, you will um, just use the project, <coughs> or you will just point it to a filter, and then it will do everything else for you. Then you just hit save, and it will make you a pretty pie chart, and then you can just experiment until you get it displaying the uh, information you want. You might have to go back in and tweak your filter a little, uh, but it's a really great place to come up with some helpful metrics. It's also a great opportunity if you've got people who are coming to you regularly for data, can you put this onto a dashboard and give them a link so that you stop having to manually give them those updates they can it updates, in, it updates when they hit the page, so um, that's a way you can automate something off your plate. Um, and I, I find that dashboards, every once in a while you work with that person, that just feels better with metrics, even if the metrics aren't that helpful, they just really like to have them. <laughs> dashboards are really great for that person because they, they have their dashboard they can look at. So. No one can relate, no one's ever worked with that person. <laughs> okay, so workflows is a really big thing that I can't cover everything. But even if you don't go in and manage the workflows, you need to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So I've given you two examples here. These are from projects that my team is using. So we have one that's backlogged, ready to start, in progress, done. That's the four states. We have one that's got more states. Um, so we've got to do in progress, then we're doing code review, then we counted dev complete, selected for our release branch, and then done. Now, um, you can customize workflows at a project level. You can customize them so bugs could have one workflow, and epics could have one workflow, and stories could have one workflow. You can add triggers to them, so um, you can tell JIRA to do specific things before or after a workflow state move, so um, you could prompt somebody to fill in a mandatory field, for example. You could make a little dialogue come up. If you're moving it to done, 
then force people to enter the resolution. That would be a common example. Uh, another common example is that JIRA has an EPIC status field and an EPIC status, I forget what they're both called, but um, you can link them so that if one updates, because they're essentially the same thing, mm. you can link them. That's just a time saver. So you, it's good and it's bad. It's good because you can customize it for your organization. It's <coughs> bad because you can customize it and make your life a nightmare with um, <coughs> customization. So um, if you're working in an environment and, and you're like, this is so frustrating. I, I have something in, to done and I want to move it back to code review because I accidentally closed it and I can't. Why? It's because someone locked it down. It doesn't work like that out of the box. Um, you could try to track down your JIRA administrator and say, so the difference here, this is my straight trans state transition trigger. So my team can move any item from any state to any state because I don't want them bogged down by having to transition it if it didn't make sense. Um, but, but that's just the way we work. So you might not have that luxury, but you can do some customizations here. Um, this is showing that in, in my organization, you know, like Epic, describe to do in progress done, but my bugs and stories, I want something a little more complicated that reflects what developers flow is actually, so basically we're matching back to GitHub flow. Um, so you can do things like that. And, um, and then getting into the triggers, the conditions, the post functions, I put a few here so you can see, because if you're not with your admin, you, you may not be able to go in and see this, um, and I wanted you to be able to. Um, some of these are out of the box, so it's just saying, um, if somebody enters a comment when they're transitioning, put that comment on the JIRA, that's just out of the box. Um, I've changed epic status to, no, I can't, actually I forget the one that I've customized here, but, um, the, the, the important takeaway when you're going in and doing this is that just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> and even if you think you should, you need to really look deep down inside yourself and ask yourself, is this going to make sense six months from now? Is this going to make sense if you're at a small company like I am and I worked with a, a company that was one team in the beginning and two years later we were six teams and growing you're going to be stuck with it for a really long time. Uh, so keep that in mind. Anytime you think of customizing, it might be really quick and easy right now today, but is this going to scale to your organization? Do you really want to commit yourself to managing this customization across a lot of projects and teams? Um, that's where I'm going to leave workflows. You can do a lot, but you should mostly. <laughs> Uh, so I also just want to touch on plugins because the other thing about Jira is there's thousands and so a lot of times if you're thinking well if your developers are saying well I wish I could just do time right in Jira well you can there's like four different plugins for that there's cheap ones and expensive ones and ones that do everything um, so if, if you are missing functionality before you try to build something look for what's in the marketplace you don't have to be a Jira you'd have to be a Jira admin to install install it, but you can browse the marketplace as a user, it's just a public website you can go to, you can see what's out there. Um, I gave, this is just a snapshot from their website highlighting what they want to highlight today, um, but like there's actually thousands. So before you try to build anything, check what's out there. Um, some of them are even free, there used to be a lot of free stuff, most of them charge now, but some of them are really cheap, especially if you have a small user base. Um, sometimes it's just worth it to save yourself some work. And then on the same note are the integrations. So there's a lot you can do. If you have other Atlassian tools in your environment like Confluence, you've got Bitbucket, if you've got, um, I don't know, what are some of the other examples? Um, don't they have Trello? Yeah, I do think they own Trello now, yeah. Um, so <coughs> HipChat. You can have, you know, you can get a notification in your hip chat room or your Slack room if certain items get updated, or um, you could have a comment tag itself to a uh, JIRA item. So if you need to automate some of those workflows, those opportunities are available to you. The app integrations are there. Um, you can um, automate some of your reporting tasks 
with additional tools. There's a lot of ones that will enhance the reporting functionality of JIRA. There are tools that will um, make administering JIRA simpler, so it will give you a simpler view for administering. And um, it's not just limited to the internal ones, so there's a lot of external tools that offer the integrations as well. Um, you can integrate even thinking outside software development. Um, there's CRM integrations. Maybe that's useful for your sales team, your marketing team. You, you know, maybe you're a project manager and you're trying to keep all of these people up to date. Well, look for integration opportunities. You may not actually need to be going into all these tools. You may be able to customize um, some integrations and have those notifications going straight from Jira out to other apps or from other apps into um, what you need. So not just within software development. And um, if, if that's not enough, there's, a, there's Rust API available from Jira as well. I don't know if anyone in this room is going to go and create their own API integrations, but if what they offer out of the box isn't enough, you can, or you can find a developer who will. So, <laughs> depends on how frustrated they are. They yeah. can be very willing if they don't like your flow. <laughs> um, and then um, on the developer topic, there's smart commits. So, um, if their most of their day-to-day -day work is in GitHub or Bitbucket or something like that, you can uh, set up smart commits. So, when they're doing their commit message, they can have a comment automatically go onto a Jira or they can even transition from one state to another. So they, with their commit message, they could have an item move to close in JIRA, for example. Um, that can be, a, a lot of developers tell me, I don't want to be going into JIRA <coughs> every day because my flow is in GitHub. Um, so they would prefer to just be able to manage it with a, a Git commit. And, I'm a little over on time, but this is the second last slide. So the next gen projects I just wanted to touch on, like I said, this is available in cloud. Um, you mentioned that Jira owns Trello now. So in my opinion, what they did was take really complex Jira and give you Trello. So it's like Trello in Jira. But um, it looks pretty. They stripped out all of the global administration. So the way a next gen project works is the team Everyone on the team has administrative control of that project. So if you're an administrator and you're like, oh, I got all these <coughs> teams spinning up and they're doing crazy things and I just do not have time to manage all their projects, you can give those teams a next gen project and say, go nuts. And they won't break, they can mess with their own workflows, they won't impact other teams. Um, it's also, I think they're going after like a non-software development team too. So you've got business teams wanting to use Jira and things like that. Next gen projects are a great solution for them. You do lose some functionality with <coughs> next gen projects, but you gain usability and simplicity. So there's your trade off. One other thing you gain with a next gen project is a roadmap view. Um, this is a quick win if you don't want to buy like AHA or Codemon. Some of these um, product management tools are really, really expensive. If you're a small company, um, the next gen project will give you. I've been sending you away the whole time. I just realized. <laughs> um, it just gives you this. It, it's simple, as you can see. These are just epics. It's not like as robust as a full product management tool. But if you don't have something, you don't have the budget for something else. Um, a next gen project might be a way of meeting the needs of a product management or a business team, um, or even just a, 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 an agile startup team that wants to go do their own thing. And so here's my complaints. <coughs> I think that Jira has some of the best documentation for any software I've ever used. So you really do not need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to using Jira. Chances are, if you're trying to do something, someone else in the world has done it and they wrote a blog post about it, you don't have to figure it out for yourself. You just have to Google it and you'll probably find it. And if you truly can't find anyone that has, you might want to question whether you should <laughs> because <laughs> there's a lot of Jira users out there. Um, yeah, if they thought it was dumb, it probably is. <laughs> yeah. um, Oh, and the other thing I, I just put on here, just a, a random tidbit, a random tip. 
Um, Jira has, Atlassian, I'm using those words interchangeably, but um, Atlassian has published uh, a suite of documentation, you might say, that's not specific to Jira. It's actually how to do Agile. They have Scrum tutorials, they have Kanban tutorials. So if you're at a company that doesn't have a lot of resources for Agile training, um, they actually put a bunch of stuff up on their website and it's available for free. I personally think it's, it's good quality material. It's not maybe really in depth, but it's good. Um, and it's free. So I wanted to highlight that one to everybody that it's out there. So no one went fast, but questions? Um, just more of a comment that reminded me, there, Atlassian also has like a newsletter you can sign up for, like an e-newsletter, and it will send you, I don't know if it's <coughs> weeks, like usually get an email that has the kind of new features. And, like that. and they also have a lot of like blog posts about like how to be agile and stuff. But um, the new features one is the most useful, I found for me. It's, mm. it's um, I've, I've learned a lot over the years by getting that newsletter, so I really <coughs> signing up for that. I'll try to remember to add that to my links page before I post it. Any other quick tips anyone wanted to shout out? That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you're searching for help, if you're on cloud, put cloud in the search. Yes. <laughs> ah. Because I can't remember how many times I've gone to an article and oh yeah, this is great, this is easy, and then I notice up at the top, this is for server. Right. And so, uh, for, for people starting out with JQL, if they see an existing filter, if they just go to advanced, they can load the filter out and see how the pros have done it, if you like. Yes, and copying other people so yeah. you don't have to do it yourself. <laughs> That's how we built web pages in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> Being inspired. <laughs> so I, I know past the end. I had a question around like how uh, like if you've used it for continuous delivery and how you might use the the versioning. I know it you've been conversant with either microservices, continuous delivery, Swami or you or anyone else has had experience with that. My company is um, AWS microservices and um, the main team is using continuous delivery. Mm -hmm. We're doing it with um, Kanban and we're not setting releases. Okay. So I won't say I have a perfect solution. I don't know if anyone else has something they want to throw out. You just assume when it's in a done state or a full state that it's in production. That's why you saw the um, selected for release. That's our holding area. If it's in done, I tell my developers all the time, it's in production if you move that ticket to done. Don't move it to done and then tell me it's in staging. Yeah. <laughs> done means done. So the, the concept of version is one that I find is most overlooked when I deal with teams that are new to Jira or not using it effectively. Because version is another bucket in which you can collect things and associate them with dates. Or, and in Jira speak, versions become released. So yes. they, they turn into releases, but for people who are not fussed about whether it's actually released or not, they just want to see the collection, mm -hmm. what do I get on a certain date? Version is your answer. Yes, that's a good point. And sometimes I see people trying to manage with labels, but then you don't get the out-of-the-box reporting that using releases would give you. So get when it. I came into my current company, they were using sprints to oh, right. pass versions. So they, they would, you know, they put everything into a sprint. And like these, these are all the candidates for this next version. That was one of the first things they changed. They were just <laughs> using versions. I can't use any reporting with this uh, this way. So can I do waterfall? Can you do waterfall in Jira? Yeah. Huh. Oh, sure. Why not? I haven't tried. <laughs> it has a template. Yes. People are saying yes. Yeah. Greenhopper was the first one. Yeah. Before that, it was it was waterfall. Sir, so you had a question in the back. Oh no, I was just stating you could use the spring, but you have to make sure you keep your vision right, because at the end of moving on to your next vision, if you have to. Search for all the you've done and the certain number of sprints, and the coding is actually find this as a new solution. Because you could you version your uh, software version. Because you could get lost trying to figure out everything for sprints. Oh, yeah, I moved them to, to fixed version. And now yeah, I'm, using, I'm using the version reports and everything else. Because we still do a whole bunch of sprints and everything for us. It's specifically version in terms of the report. So. Yeah, and when you, you say that, it reminds me of shred claims too, and sometimes when you're trying to put together those shred 
claims that people are doing oh. income tax rebate. Um, the stuff you can pull out of JIRA can make that a lifesaver. That's from like the 80s. <laughs> 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 it's with a lot of money. So I have a question there on this mechanism, the integration of Git. Do you utilize like one of the plugins or do you just use what's needed with the JIRA? Um, I have to, it's on my to-do list to finish setting it up. Um, we have the GitHub integration, and I'm hoping I don't have to do anything else, but <coughs> in a couple weeks, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. So your devs will tell you how successful it is? Yeah, yeah. someone told me I'll have to set up a webhook listener, I was like, I don't think so. I'm mm -hmm. hoping that the out-of-the-box integration does not work. We're well, using the GitLab uh, versus GitHub integration because GitLab you can have uh, at your own home server, which is locked down from the outside, and it has the same sort of features to close the commits and stuff. Easy to set up, but probably not much else. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's sort of like a, a, in, in your project, there's a Jira button. You click on it, you just open Jira. Mm -hmm. So everything else is set in your, like, in your commits, but maybe it's for developers and it's the developer API way of talking to computer. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thank